what's going on? It's floor time in the uh, convertible. So we got our Wolfsburg West pans in there, and they fit perfect. No cutting, no slicing or dicing. Didn't have to trim the front there. Look how, look how sweet that is. Nice fit. You, the the uh, cheaper pans you got to cut off up there and make them fit. But uh, not these. These are really nice. They're uh, double the money, and I think they're worth every penny if you're going to keep your car. If you're trying to just you know do something pretty cheap and sell it. The cheaper pans are a good way to go, but if you're going to go through all this work, I think either, either cutting an original piece out and grafting that in, or buying one of these Westberg pans is the way to go. Just the sheer thickness of the metal, the safety factor of the seat rails, the way they're welded. These are welded double. I always come back in and put a spot weld on them. When I uh, weld the pan in, I'll put a couple beads on these seat rails so they don't pop off but these are much better than what you get with most pans and the quality of the steel is a lot better much thicker so anyway we got it fitted in here got a few patches to make here and there but all in all not too bad and we're going to spot weld this in here normally when i do them for a scooter he likes them welded all the way down but uh have you ever got to take them out again or do a collision repair or anything like that it's sort of a uh, really hard once you do that also it warps the pan a little bit when you weld them in like that from what I've seen and this is just as good I think to spot weld them in like the factory does and then you can uh, seam seal it with some uh, 3m panel adhesive or panel bond and uh, you're good to go. The panel bond's got a rust agent in it, so it uh, works really good and it flows out nice. So we got the holes marked. We're going to pull this back out and uh, grind all those spots. Put some weld through primer on them, grind the pan, and uh, weld this side in. And then start putting our patches and stuff in. I did strip the other side of the car down because nobody was buying it. Not painted. So, uh... Figured I'd go ahead and do the floors and paint it and put a top on it. And uh, it's probably about, I'm gonna go ahead and freshen the stock motor up in the tranny, go through that. Just clean the motor up, it's basically you know good to go. But the transmission needs synchronizers. And uh, don't know if I'll buy all this trim for the doors and stuff. It's $720 uh, for the door trim on these convertibles. I looked that up the other night. So I might drill this off and try to go to like soft seal or something and find something that'll be adequate for the inside of the door here and uh, maybe fasten a new weather strip to the this piece of chrome to the glass so I don't have water going down in the door. I have to take this chrome off anyway. This door split right here so that needs to be uh, welded up. Ordered some uh, 035 TIG wire and then trying to uh, TIG weld the body panels a lot less heat and it makes it real sweet so waiting on that to get in but uh stripped it all the way down to metal and i did find a little bit of rust right here and a little bit at the bottom of this door right here but nothing major so uh real happy with the condition for a convertible it's pretty pretty clean i did find out that the uh wood's rotten under the top there where the top staples down so we're gonna have to pull that all off and uh we're going to replace the top anyway, but we're going to replace all that wood back there. And uh, I bought new door handles for it, dash knobs. And uh, well, I don't know if I'm going to buy door panels or just recover these. We'll have to wait and see. Not a lot of budget for this. We're trying to do it as cheap as possible. If you spend too much money, people just never buy them. I mean, I thought the car was a pretty good value. At ten grand before I started all this, but you know, people just didn't want to deal with the floors and stuff, so that's why we're where we're at now. So I got a couple questions I'm going to try to answer, and uh, as quick as possible, I do try to answer or make a video based off the uh, questions that are left in the uh, comment section. So one of the questions I have is about these service manuals. These are from uh, VW, and they're called without guesswork. You can pick these up used. Uh, they used to be available at the dealer. Not anymore though. Uh, 
It's going to be an eBay item or the Samba. Uh, these were given to me by VW Rich. VW Rich is friends with uh, HO Motorsports. He was a mechanic at Toyota. And uh, he was nice enough to pass these on to me. But these have all your different measurements. If you're doing kingpin, linkpin, so if you want to torque anything or know anything about your Volkswagen, everything will be in here. This is uh, type 1, 2, and 3. So if you had a type 4 course, you would need a different book. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm getting over the flu. I got that on top of this uh, back thing. So it's been a real pleasant recovery. Somebody was asking me about barrel shims or what these shims are that we use. And these are basically these type of shims go underneath the bottom of the barrel between the uh, case and the barrel. And uh, they add deck height. The more barrel spacer you put under, the more deck height you get at the top. And what I mean by deck height is the measurement where the piston comes to the top of the cylinder. The further down in the cylinder, that's more deck height. The closer to the top of the cylinder, less deck height. Further down, less compression, higher up, more compression. Uh, on the stroker motors, what they do uh, to accommodate for the stroke on the crankshaft, they actually move the pin up towards the oil ring, which you can see right here. This is a 90 and a half with a, a 82 stroke, and it's right at the oil ring. And then if you look at this 94, that's made for 69 stroke, it has a little area under the ring, where this one is right into it. So the ring actually sits right on top of the pin. And you can actually, if we get a piston made, a lot of times the pin will be right into the ring. And the, the pin will actually be, the skirt will be sucked in there. That's what they call a slipper skirt. And the pin will actually go through the bottom of the ring. Uh, don't like to do it that way. It makes the ring sort of uh, weak. So this is a piston I had made and it's in between stock and this, the factory location. This was for a Baja car. This is a cheater piston. And uh, that's one race. A Baja 1000 there. Beat up. But that was 87. So uh, cheater motor. It was a half of 87, half, half 1600. So, uh, but anyway, getting back on the uh, compression height. This is the compression height. When they say compression height, that'll be where the pin's located in the piston. And that'll determine where this piston's going to land at the top of the cylinder. The other thing that we can use to lower the compression are these uh, copper head gaskets. And they go into the cylinder head up here, which will sit on top of the cylinder instead of on the bottom of it. They go between the head and the cylinder. These uh, work pretty good. I like to use these in my uh, turbo car. They seem to seal up better than just the, the cylinder on top of the uh, head. The copper is a little soft, you know, and it sort of locks down. You can blow these, though. I have one right here. This is actually the last motor that we did. These were left out of it. And uh, one of these is blown right there. You can see it caught up on the uh, head when they bolted the head down. It wasn't sitting flat in there. And you can see the black area where it leaked compression by. So you want to make sure they fit in there really nice. There's no bind. It's sitting flat all the way in the head if you're going to use those. And the copper gasket is a one-time deal. Uh, we used to, uh, on the funny car team, we could actually bake the head gaskets and use them over. But uh, I don't know if you could do that with these. And I don't think I would try for what these cost. You can get those from uh, SCAT CB Performance. Uh, normally, if I'm going to do a race motor, get them from Clark. And make uh, head gaskets for alcohol funny cars, top fuel cars. And they have, uh, I don't know, I think the copper is a little better material. And they make them out of the drops. When they uh, make the funny car gaskets, if you call them up, they'll, uh, you give them the measurement you want. And they'll make anything you need. So... That's a good, uh, they'll make them any thickness too, so. So we covered the uh, copper gaskets, the barrel shims, pin location. The other thing that can affect the compression ratio would be the depth of the combustion chamber, the amount of cc's that are under the deck here. The deck is where the cylinder sits, and your volume of cc's would be in the chamber here. That's what you'll hear that, you know, some of them have 53 cc's, 52, 54, 
small block Chevrolet is like 72 big blocks like 119 depends on the motor you know uh, anytime you reduce this area and lower this deck you're going to raise the compression this is a good indication of that you can see how there's not a lot of area from the deck to the valve and these have been cut for compression or these are street heads so you have quite a bit of difference in the area right here between the valve and the deck we'll go over here and you can see how shallow that is so we're going to have much higher compression with this head that's more like 14 to 1 this is more like nine and a half so the other thing uh, that, that you can do is you can uh, get a custom rod made. Uh, SCAT makes different length rods. You got them right here. So I have them in uh, 5.325, 500, 5.5, and 5.7. Five, 5.7 five, seven. Five, seven is the factory rod out of a uh, small block Chevrolet, the length. But uh, the rod length determines where the piston's going to come in the barrel. A lot of times if you go to a real long rod, I, I use the shortest rod possible usually in a turbo application. But uh, long rods make the motor real wide and hard to get in the engine compartment. I like to try to custom locate the pin and use as little barrel sh uh, spacer as possible. So, uh, the 2110 we built, we don't have any barrel spacers <coughs> under that. I think we have uh, some thin shims under there. We're running a copper gasket, so we're running, uh, I think it's 10 and a half to 1. So it's, it's a little high for a street motor, but it's a it's a snotty street motor. So you, know, you have to run good gas in that and be careful with the timing and stuff. <coughs> so I think we covered all the stuff. These are uh, different types of rods. These rods were donated to me. And I found some a few things that probably uh, that I don't like. You know, I'm picky though, and uh, I was just raised that way. It's nothing personal. When somebody gives you something, it's with the best intent, you know. So, but I'm going to let Matt use these on one of his projects, uh, maybe a stalker or something, and I'll point out a few things that I found. Uh, first off, Matt ordered these rods under the assumption that they were going to be A&A. &A. Uh, the first ones came in A&A, &A, but they were uh, Chevy Journal instead of Volkswagen. And a lot of times on the aftermarket cranks, you can order it with a Chevy Journal, a Volkswagen journal and if you get into the really high dollar stuff you can get a Honda Honda journal which is much smaller the smaller the bearing surface the less friction the more bearing speed you uh, can have you can turn more RPMs with less bearing speed is what I should say the smaller the bearing is but anyway uh, these rods I, I got to looking at them and the first problem was the wrist pin wouldn't fit the big end or the little end so I had to clearance the pin a little bit, and if you look at this factory rod, you can actually see a little surface, uh, the bushing there, and the rod. And if you look at this, there's, there's no area left. It's like uh, very thin. Hardly any bushing left. So I would imagine under any kind of cylinder pressure, that bushing would fail uh, pretty rapidly. There's not a lot of material there between the uh, bushing and the steel. Uh, normally when the material is that thin, it's susceptible to the heat. Once it heats up, the rod will release this and uh, you, you know you can have some issues. Uh, the other issue is the bolts aren't equal length. Uh, uh, they're an imitation ARP bolt and uh, they have the alloy stamped on them, but they don't have any you know ARP or any manufacturer designation. Ended up calling the manufacturer and talked to them for a while and convinced them to give me the torque specs after a little bit of a conversation. And uh, they, they agreed on 38 foot pounds. Uh, so they wanted them to torque that. I asked them what the stretch should be and they had no idea. So, uh, you know, you sort of want that information if you're going to buy an aftermarket rod and it doesn't come with all that stuff. It's probably not the right company. Uh, SCAT will give you that information. I know A&A &A does. They'll give you a torque spec and they give you a stretch number this is a stretch gauge and it measures the rod bolt the overall length of the bolt and as you torque it you want the bolt to stretch to about six thousandths uh, of an inch so it has a clamping load if the bolt doesn't stretch and it's just tight against the surface here it won't have any clamping load and the cap will leave the rod so it's very important to uh, know the stretch of the bolt this is never an issue with a Volkswagen rod because the bolt is so superior uh, 27 foot pounds that will make 200 horsepower and never fail so the other issue that I found 
you can uh, look at the rod here. This is a Volkswagen rod, and this surface here is what determines our side clearance on the rod. And there's a cheek on the crank that this rides on, a machine surface. And uh, if this surface is too uh, large, the distance between here and the crank, you'll lose oil pressure out of here if you have too much side load. And the more side load you get, the rod starts doing this. And it'll start, you know, jamming up the wrist pin and uh, trying to push the wrist pin out of the motor and cause all kinds of issues. So we like to try to keep the uh, side clearance to a minimum and uh, make sure that we have enough shelf area on the rod where it can be supported on the crank. Now, I'll show these two in comparison. You can see this side has a little bit of shelf area up here. Uh, we're going to flip the rod over. And we have nothing. It's almost like a uh, knife here. This is more than likely going to try to machine into the crank and cut into the crankshaft. It's very thin here. And basically what we got here is we have core shift. It means when you build a rod, an aluminum rod, you'd start with a piece of material much like this billet here. And you would machine the rod out of it. And uh, your core shift, your machine would determine this piece of metal. And it would machine everything on center so all your machine surfaces would be round like this. A lot of times on a small block Chevrolet, if you're looking for a good factory block, you'll look at the core shift around the camshaft area and you want this to be symmetrical all around the cam. A lot of times on small block 400s, it'll be real high on one side, real low on the other, and you want it to be symmetrical. It's where the cam's in relationship to the uh, actual crankshaft. This is the same thing. You just have a poor machining process and they didn't find center. So they had to machine it and machined all the ledge out there. So <coughs> I don't know if I would trust those. They might be okay in a stock situation, but uh, that's where we're at with that. Matt, I saw you were trying to build an intake manifold. I don't want to sell this. I had somebody ask me about this before, and uh, this is built by a friend of mine, Kenny. It's a Kender Link is what I call it. It's Kenny, Kendrick, whatever you know him by. Uh, he was one of the guys down at the shop there, and uh, he's quite the fabricator. And uh, we grew up together. He made this piece and uh, gave it to me. And uh, it's not for sale, but if you'd like to use it and try it out and see if that's what you need, you're welcome to it. So I just wanted to offer that to you. And then the other question I had was about crankshafts. Uh, I got the scat book out here. And uh, this is a flange crank. Somebody was asking me what a flange crank was. This is a flange crank. If you're going to buy a flange crank, probably buy it from SCAT, I would suggest. Uh, I know A&A &A makes them. I heard they're pretty damn good. I like SCAT because you can order the case and the crank at the same time. Normally a flange crank has a 411 center main, which is a Type 4, which is larger, so you have to you know, do some machine work. And then the back of the case needs to be cut for the flange, so uh, it's best to buy it as a matching set. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to have your case machine, and uh, this is probably an all-out race situation. It basically has the same bolt pattern as a Chevrolet. Uh, I think the old ones were uh, six bolt, and the new are eight, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if you're going to get a Trico clutch, like, a, uh, you know, the Rev 6 from uh, Ron Lemus, you're going to want to buy a flange crank. And all his stuff is uh, matched to the... Uh, New flange bug pack had a, a six bolt and now they're everybody's eight bolt. So uh, that's something to consider. We bought a clutch for the uh, Pro Mod and it has a uh, bug pack crank in it, which was six bolts. So the uh, when we got the Ron Loomis flywheel and stuff, it, it, it won't fit to the, the back of the crankshaft. So now we have to freshen the motor and put a new crank in there to use that clutch. But all your uh, slipper clutches, your double disc clutches are gonna be based off this flywheel. Uh, this flywheel comes machined for the floaters, and it's uh, probably the best way to go if you're going to go all out race, if you're not going to go with Potter. Uh, this is the crank that I use in my car right here. And this is a uh, 4340 Chrome Molly billet. And they have the uh, 4340, they have the uh, billet one, they have a counterweighted cast, they have a forged full stroker, they have a few different selections. So you want to make sure. When you call these guys, you're going to tell them, hey, I'm going to torture the shit out of it, you know. And if you're going to race it, you definitely want a billet crank, uh, not just a uh, forge crank. 
The uh, flange cranks are all billet. The uh, 4130 bolt scat stroker is good for a street motor, you know. If you're going to get up into the 400 horsepower or start you know, building turbo stuff, get into the 600 horsepower range, you're definitely going to want a flange crank so the flywheel doesn't leave the motor. So this is a much better attachment method than the dowel pins in one clan nut. So, so anyway, hopefully that answered some questions. And uh, everybody's doing good out there. Hope everybody's doing good. I'm going to hold the camera out here. I know Mike F., he, he hates this. But, uh, sorry Mike, if my arm was longer, I wouldn't be so damn close to the camera, but it's just how I was born. Short-legged and short-armed. But, uh, yeah, so that's what's going on here. Getting over the flu. Got that when I was recovering from this back thing. So, uh, I think I'm about to kick it. My uh, daughter picked it up today. She didn't make it to school. So, normally you have to give it to somebody before you get better. So, I hate to give it to my daughter, but... Hopefully she'll uh, get over it. It was hard on me. So I've decided with this 2110, I'm not having much luck uh, selling this. Of course, you know, you have to advertise stuff to sell it. But uh, no bueno with that. And I was thinking about uh, throwing a turbocharger on this and putting the carburetors up for sale. I have a... Uh, wouldn't be able to sell the manifold is the only thing. And I'll have to build an intake manifold. I know that... Uh, Ray Jr., back when he had his Volkswagen shop, I enjoyed Jackson's old race car. I forget the guy that has that car now. Jamaican dudes, they were wanting to go turbocharged. And I had the uh, manifold that bolted to the 48 IDA manifolds. And I uh, actually gave him all that stuff and let him have it. It was on the dragster that we used to have. And uh, I probably should have kept it. I don't think they ever used it. But I'll make some more. I have to get some... Uh, gasket so I can go get some flanges flame cut and then with some tubing and we'll make a uh, log for the top there I think I'm gonna actually use this header so I'm gonna cut that flange off and put a v-band down there and then put the turbo probably in the package tray or hidden somewhere but uh, yeah that's just like I said the compression's a little high we'll probably run it on E85 I figured that'd be a way to get away with it I've never put a Volkswagen on E85 yet and I figured why not try it with this one. A little street race car would be fun. On some E85 and if nothing else we could run methanol. That's what we run in Noel's car. And it uh, it works pretty well. Don't know how it would work for the street. But E85 is pretty much methanol. To a certain extent. I know there's quite a few gas stations around me that have it. So it wouldn't be a problem. And then VP sells it too. So me and Hans talked about it and he thought the E85 would be a good alternative rather than take the motor back apart and put barrel spacer under it and that would be our other option these spacers here are actually out of that motor uh, we were going to do it turbocharged first and I didn't think the parts would uh, you know hold up to that so I decided to go aspirated but uh, in retro retrospect I don't think uh, aspirated would be any easier on the motor than uh, turbocharged it's usually less RPM when you turbocharge it than when you aspirate something, you know, you turn it harder. So that's what's going on with that. I got to get the 73 going here, but this is the car that I'm going to be selling. So I've been working on this one and uh, yeah, maybe today I'll come out here and pull this floor out. Now that I got that marked, grind that down and get this side welded in and do something. I don't want to get too crazy though. It's the first day I actually felt a little better. So, you know, that's usually what I do. I start feeling better and I go out and kill myself and then I feel crappy again. But anyway, hopefully that answered some questions. I did dig a turbo up for a little project there and a carburetor. So, I think I got everything for my project. I just got to do it. And uh, we'll save those rods for another project. And Matt did give me a set of these uh, pistons. He gave me some ANAs and the uh, malls. I went ahead and used the malls, put some rings on them. And uh, maybe we'll build some sort of a grenade motor out of that. A little uh, 19, 14, or 15. I want to build a small motor again and turbocharge it because I had really good luck with 
making a lot of mile an hour with a smaller motor than the big motor. The big motor seems to leave hard but not run out the back door like the little motor did. So I don't know. That's where we're at with that. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this off before I make you guys uh, motion sickness or give you motion sickness. And uh, we'll talk to you in a day or two. I'll try to get out of here and uh, get more regular on the videos. I appreciate you guys subscribing to the channel. Uh, I know I've had another thousand people subscribe and usually the videos are a little more on the regular, but uh, recovering from some surgery, I gotta take it sort of slow before I come back out here and you know hurt myself. So I haven't thought about going back to work for somebody, but uh, it's turning out to be harder than I thought with uh, you know my medical thing so most people don't want anybody that's had any kind of back injury so it looks like i'm going to be self-employed or a permanent youtuber so uh yeah got to make this work you know it's pretty much what's dealt so uh like they say you, you play the cards that you're dealt so that's what i'm doing making the best out of a bad situation but anyway i did uh have some fun working on this. I actually enjoyed stripping this, believe it or not. I wasn't in any hurry and um, looking forward to driving the old convertible again. Uh, doesn't seem like it's going to be a real dragged out project, which is uh, good because I hate that kind. Unless when I strip this side, it's a total disaster. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to find a little bit of rust on the bottom of the doors and uh, the car is pretty damn solid. So I'm uh, real lucky with that. Convertibles usually aren't very solid. Don't know if I'm going to be able to afford all of this at once. I'm going to definitely try to get the car painted. And then the top will come after that. Because the top's probably going to be about $1,000, I would imagine. Uh, by the time I pay $450 for the skin. And then, you know, I'm going to end up probably having to get help. I'm going to buy a rear window seal. And all that good stuff will add up very quickly. Uh, like I said, the biz biggest expense is the... Uh, window rubbers stuff like that so i need to try to uh see if i can come up with some sort of a material that i can put on here and uh you know make some seals rather than spend the 720 dollars uh it does come with all this stuff and it's a kit you know you can't just buy independent pieces uh it seems to be everywhere i go they want to sell all of it or none of it <laughs> so i did buy the piece for the window up here i was able to get that uh, got that from Wolfsburg too a little pin and the uh chrome piece there they sent me a little pedal uh stop for free thanks guys i appreciate that wolfsburg west man those are great guys over there you always get your stuff and the, the customer service is like second to none so it's uh it's cool dealing with people that that are volkswagen people and these guys are definitely cool uh the first time i bought from them i know mr vw gigolo he lives out there in california he went over there and they let him go through the place with the camera and show me the floors and i was a little apprehensive of paying double the money for the floor pans not ever seeing one before uh, once you see one this is pretty much the way you go the quality is just outstanding and i'm sure if you live out in california you know it's probably a cheaper deal because you don't have to have them shipped but uh you're way ahead of the game uh, these are much much firmer than the replacement pans that we normally see. Uh, I've got another convertible out back, which is a late model convertible. It's a 78, and it's in really good condition. Uh, I was painting that car, and Scooter decided that he didn't want the car. So he told me to keep the car. It's mine. Do whatever I want with it. And i sort of been wanting to build like a Perkins uh, turbo drag car out of it but i don't have the money to do that but i do need to bring it around and put the pans in it i have uh, the pans fitted for it i never welded them in and they're the thinner ones so what i'll try to get that bring one of those pans around and compare them to the other Wolfsburg pan over there so you can see the difference in the thickness and the quality of the uh seat rails and stuff it's completely worth the money but anyway i'm going to go ahead and shut this off now that i've told you i'm going to end the video four or five times famous for that you guys uh hope you come back thanks for all the nice comments thanks for all the uh, messages and well wishes i appreciate it and if anybody knows what i did with the keys to my truck and trailer please leave a comment down below don't forget to subscribe hit the bell 
punch that like button for me help grow the channel and guys that are up there in the cold weather take a look at this beautiful day the Lord has given us nothing but blue skies not even a puffy cloud to show you our contrail today but anyway I hope you guys are doing good and you guys are all feeling good thanks for the videos you guys are putting out don't get discouraged over the YouTube stuff everything comes in time it took five years to build this channel and some of you guys are doing just fine so hang in there